Hello everybody and welcome to another video by the Bowtie Teacher. I'm really excited about this video because I've been working on this for a little while now and what I hope to do is share with you my findings from analysing all of the data that's gone before in terms of the, the papers and to try to predict what's going to come up. I'll also try to put some information together so that you can practice these topics and make sure that you're ready for the real thing in January. What's important for me to say from the start is that these predictions aren't going to be 100% guaranteed and there's no substitution for you actually studying everything as best you can between now and January 7th. However, if there's things that you want to try to think about and be more efficient with your study, then this video will help you prepare for that a bit more effectively to ensure that your time is best spent. The patterns and trends that I'm about to show you are based on a very small sample size because we've got hardly any papers to work with. And when I'm making predictions about what will come up on paper one compared to paper two, then it's possible that they could be completely the wrong way around, or that they might not be assessed at all, or that the, the exam board have actually come up with new things that they want to try and put into papers that haven't come up before. The most important thing you can do is study as best you can, and this will help you to try and focus your study down a certain path, which will give you that advantage when it comes to January. So let's look at the data and see if there's anything that we can pull out from there. Let's get started. So I think it's important that I show you exactly what I've done uh, in, in the first instance so that you can decide whether you actually agree with this method and whether you want to go down this path of prediction in the first place. So let's have a look at question one from 2019. In this question, you can see it's a volume of a cylinder question. But what I've done is I've broken this down so that when you check the mark scheme, you can see which topics are actually assessed for each mark. So for example, for question one, the volume of the cylinder is actually only a small part of this question. For the second part, for the second mark, you need to have the ability to convert 1.5 litres into centimetres cubed, so this is converting units. And then the third mark is for rounding your answer to one decimal place. So you can see that the volume of the cylinder, whilst it's an important part of the question, it's only a small part of the question, and it only contributes a very small proportion of your actual overall marks. So as you go through, there's certain topics that crop up very, very often, which was actually quite surprising for me and a good thing for me to do to analyse. But there's certain things that you wouldn't actually get that many marks for. So it's important to try to focus your studies towards those areas that are going to give you the most marks. And we can start to see which marks appear on which paper. as well. So what I've done is I've gone through every single paper that's for the HR only, this is for HR, the regional papers, and you can try to link together the, the topics, the papers that they come from, and the marks available, and also the topics that are linked to that. So you might be doing a, a 3D Pythagoras question and it's linked to trigonometry, for example, so this information is all put in here. And what happens is when you visualize this in something that's a bit more useful to you, this is a bit overwhelming at first, but you can see that towards the top left of this, we have the topics that are appearing the most. Out of the 600 marks for the six papers, 21 of those marks are for being able to do angles in a polygon. So that is a topic that comes up very, very often. And we can start to break down where that information comes from. For example, we have a look at differentiation. And you can see down the right-hand side here, if I just move these a bit. That differentiation only appears in paper 1HR from January of 2019, June 2018, and June 2019. So differentiation is one of those topics that you might think, well, it's contributing 18 marks, but it only comes up on paper 1HR. So I want to make sure that I study that really well for the seventh, and potentially it should come up on the, the 7th and not the 14th, uh, the week later, or the 15th. So make sure that when you're studying, you're looking at this information and trying to pull out where your marks are going to come from. As you can see, rounding here, it's on both papers quite a lot. So it's something that's really, really important, but it's, it's, a, it's a place where students drop a lot of marks because they don't check that the answer needs to be rounded to the nearest pound or one decimal place and they do three significant figures. So if you can train yourself to look every time that you do an answer, look back to the question and check the rounding 
make sure that you're actually rounding it to the specified amount and that you're rounding it correctly. Probability is probably the, the topic that will come up the most because probability is, is, is spread throughout the papers. So I've, I've put harder probability here, for example, the ones where you have multiple pathways. So you have like the counters that have like one to six on them and you have to do many, many possibilities if you don't know how to get around that. But also there's probability, um, the basic probability trees, there's, there's some marks available for that. And the basic probability where, for example, you have to just say Barney goes to college 200 times in a year, how many times is he going to be late? And then probability also appears when you're estimating and, and taking information from, say, a cumulative frequency graph, you take it from a histogram, and you also take it from Venn diagrams where they're saying, right, well, what's the probability that they're going to be uh, playing the piano and not the, the, the guitar or something like that? So these, these topics appear a hell of a lot. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together some questions for you to practice because those are the ones that come up the most. Now, when we look at this second bit of information I've got here, this is the topics, and you can see the spread between the two papers. So paper one is in gold and paper two is in purple. And you can see that differentiation here is one of those topics that will appear most in paper one. Now, that's not to say, again, that it's not going to come up in paper two, but you should really study that for paper one because from the data you can see that that's quite likely to come up. And when we look at differentiation, we've got to make sure that we understand what's the purpose of differentiation, what does it tell us. It tells us the turning points, it tells us the gradient of the tangent of a curve. So if you can understand that, then you're, you're more likely to get those marks because there's so many marks available. It's a large proportion of your marks for that particular paper, so seven, six, five, so you're averaging six marks per paper. And in the examiner's report, which I encourage you to download from the website, the edXL website, it says that students really struggle when you have differentiation in terms of displacement, velocity, and acceleration. So they actually say that that's something that students need to work on. So they're going to they're ask you that again, to keep hammering that until you understand as a cohort that differentiation can be used with velocity and acceleration because if you have acceleration and it's it's got a term of a variable like t in there then you can't use um, speed equals distance divided by time and things like that you have to use differentiation and calculus to work those questions out so let's like take a look at those things that are more likely to come up in paper one and then after paper one has come out and, and we've done paper one then it'll be very obvious to us what's going to come up in paper two, so stay tuned for that video. So angles in a polygon, we're looking at simple things such as area, uh, angles within a triangle add up to 180. That crops up all the time, but also looking at exterior angles of a polygon, interior angles sum, and then if it's a regular polygon, using that information in a more difficult question. Ratios for paper one, Ratios, the more basic ratios, where you're taking a value and you're splitting up between people, like money, and you split it between two or three people, but also the more difficult ratios where you're using vectors, you're using ratios in similar shapes where you have the ratio of the length of A to the length of B, and then you look at the surface area squared and the volume is cubed. So ratios appear quite often. Uh, indices, the harder ones tend to be in paper two, but the more basic ones, which uh, are a bit further along, they come up more in paper one. So when you're doing things like x cubed times x to the four, and you might have five x squared, y cubed, and then they put brackets around that and raise that to the power of three. So those sort of more basic indices are more likely to come up in paper one. And then the harder ones where you have something like um, a times 10 to the 2n, and then, it, and then it does a to the 2 thirds and things like that. So those types of questions are the ones that appear in paper two, but that's, again, not to say that it's not going to come up in question, uh, paper one. Simultaneous equations, they are something that come up everywhere. So the basic linear ones where you have 
2x plus 3y equals 5, and then 3x plus 5y equals 11. For example, you would you would see those more likely in paper 1, but then in paper 2, there's a spread of simultaneous equations where you have a quadratic. So you need to be able to do both of those types because they're going to appear quite a lot across the two papers. And so a quadratic is kind of an even split. So it's 50-50 that you're likely to see simultaneous equations. Make sure that you can substitute into the quadratic, expand that all out correctly, use the calculator functions to be able to double check your answers and get your answers as coordinates. Now, sometimes they do something extra that they might do a midpoint between those two coordinates that you've just found. And so you need to be able to take the average of those two as well. Circle theorems, here you can see there's an even spread and they range from the more difficult ones. But the Edexcel seem to like to hammer this alternate segment theorem. So take a look at my other video on circle theorems, which is it's called GCSE topics my students wanted me to go over. And I, I try and do a, a detailed breakdown there of circle theorems. Um, it's particularly alternate segment theorem. Sine and cosine rule is another one which is skewed a little bit towards paper one. And you can see that the sine and cosine rule is used, it's kind of under the radar. You don't notice that you, you have to use sine and cosine rule until you have a triangle and you start to see, right, I've got two sides, two angles, one of those is unknown. So I'm going to use the sine rule. Or I've got three sides and one angle, and one of those is unknown. That's the cosine rule. So try to learn the differences of when you use sine rule and cosine rule. But also, the formulas are in the front. Check those, and they go hand in hand quite a lot with half AB sine C, where they're working at the area of the triangle. So try to learn when you use half AB sine C. So you need the two angles, sorry, the two sides, and the angle in between them, that's half AB sine C. Another thing that comes up quite a lot is the arithmetic series. So this is when you have a, just a normal sequence, but they don't give you, for example, 2, 5, 8, 11. Like they don't give it to you like that anymore. They'll say the first term is, well, the third term is this. The sum of the first 20 terms is this. And that's something that, excuse me, that in the examiner's report that they've, they've highlighted that students still struggling with. So... When you're doing these types of questions, take a look at my videos where I go through um, June 2019 and I've given you an alternative version. You have to generate simultaneous equations again, so they crop up again. And you have to find out the first term and the common difference. That's the, the distance between or the difference between each consecutive number. Once you've done that, you can use the formula that they say is not in the uh, formula at the front. You have to learn that. So they're going to keep asking you that that question until you get it right and understand what's going on. Expanding triple brackets is another topic that uh, that they say is new to the specification and that students are still getting their head around. Expanding triple brackets is, at the moment, is quite new and so there aren't that many marks available, but that's another thing that they mentioned. It's going to keep coming up, keep coming up, and it is skewed towards um, here. It is skewed towards paper one. So expanding triple brackets is something you can practice on my website, bowtieteacher.com. If you go to GCSE Maths and see the, uh, I think it's grade 8, it might be 7, just look for expanding triple brackets. And you can practice that and it keep generating unlimited questions. Keep going until you can expand those fluently because there's quite a few marks available there to you. Equations of the straight line is another one that crops up a lot. And that's where you're giving... Uh, you're given some, some coordinates or you're given the equation of a line and it asks you to work out the perpendicular, that's very, very common, or maybe a parallel line that goes through another point. So try to have a practice at some of those questions because when you look at the national data, which I'll try to show you in a bit, you'll see that that's something that students really struggle with. And if you're going to go for a grade 7 or above, which I assume if you're watching this video, that's what you're trying to do, then that's something that will bump you up above a lot of other students because they can't do it. So I'm trying to imagine, like, you know those videos where they have superstars and how much money they're earning and it's going across and it's changing over time? Effectively, that's what's going to happen to you in your test. As the test goes on, the more marks you get, you'll bump above other people. And then what Edexcel do, and all exam boards do, is that they will just rank every single student and then they will make the cutoff based on the number of students they want to get a certain grade. So if they want the percentage of nines to go up by 1%, 
then they will cut off the students at that at that point. So you need to make sure that you're above those students. And by analyzing what they can and can't do and making sure you can do that, that will allow you to get to where you want to be. Another topic that crops up in the examiner's report and is everywhere is converting units. So students historically, this is quite apparently as a basic topic according to the exam boards, but at the higher level students can't do it very well. So if you're looking at say a meters per second and converting it into kilometers per hour, or you're looking at centimeters cubed and turning it into meters cubed, students can't really do that. So I'll put some questions together and some, some tutorials on how to do this so that you can get your head around that. And then you will be one of those students that jumps above a massive chunk of others because if they can't do it and you can, then you will pick up those marks and jump above them in the rankings. So as we go back to this diagram here, if you're looking at the top left, you want to work sort of outwards and to the, to the right and downwards because you'll see that angles in the polygon going downwards these are the most marks available. Then it goes down the differentiation column and then across here, and then it's sort of going down towards the bottom right. So what you need to do is make sure that, if nothing else, you're studying these first two columns and making sure that you're proficient and confident with all of those topics, and then start to make your way across and down and across and down and try and cover them in this particular order. So angles in a polygon I've mentioned, simultaneous equations, sine and cosine rule, circle theorems. Proof is another new topic that's new to the specification, and students just really, really struggle with that. So try to find as many proof questions as you can from your textbook, from the te test that we've covered. I'll try and think, think of some more things that you can do for proofs, and we'll practice some of those over the next couple of days, and I'll put some videos out with that as well. Group frequency is another one which you see in almost every test, um, paper one or two, it's, it's kind of spread amongst those. And from that, you're looking at cumulative frequency, you're looking at working out the mean, what's the modal class, that's cropped up a little bit. But definitely working out the mean from group frequency, students struggle to find the midpoint and then multiply it by the frequency, add that up and go through that. What I'd also try to do is put together a video where the calculator can show you a lot of things that students don't necessarily realize, like it can convert time for you, it can work out equations, like linear equations for you, it can do quadratic inequalities, it can do completing the square. So if you haven't got the Casio FX991EX white class width calculator, then I really advise you to go to your local store and get that for say 10 to 15 pounds or about 100 dirhams. And and get to grips with that calculator because that can te that can test for you so so many marks as you're going through ratios. It does simultaneous equations, so I advise you to buy that calculator. Okay, so with this national analysis data, what I've done is pulled out the information from the Edexcel website and broken it down by the skills that they test for and the grades that that students are getting and it cross-references with the number of marks that we get nationally. So the most important column really is the all column here, which is column H, and the one next to it in, in red and green is, is a kind of visual way of seeing this. So for example, for question one, paper 1HR one from June 2019, if you remember, was that volume question where the cylinder had a 10 up the side and that wasn't actually used, and that confused a lot of students. And you can see that as a percentage, students were getting about 58.7, 58%, 59% of the mark for that. So considering that was the first question in the test, students really struggle with that. And that's something that, as an example, they have to look at and think, well, do we want half of students to be struggling on, on this, this, uh, this question initially? Because it's meant to be kind of like an ease in, in of, the, of the paper to get people feeling good and, and, and confident with that. So even the next question, which was the uh, external, uh, sorry, the angle was 162 internally, only 70% of the marks were, were got on average by, uh, from that question. So that's, that's quite a difficult start to paper 1HR. And it's something that's, you know, hopefully will change. But the message is, is that as you do this paper, try not to lose 
lose hope as you as you get into the paper because historically the, the beginning of the paper has been quite tough and then sort of gets easier and then it gets harder as, as the test goes on so bear that in mind as you're doing your paper and try not to to freak out and worry too much because as you get to question four and five they're actually relatively easy and 90 96 97 percent of the of the marks are are, are, are achieved so as we look through here the things that I wanted to point out really was the the powers and roots initially the powers and roots question we're looking at things that are the more difficult powers where students are dropping marks quite regularly so if we have a look at question 5b powers and roots and we, we cross-reference that with this paper this is the question that re people really struggled with so we did the um, prime factor decomposition where we did the cherry trees and broke down the number 720 and then it said find the smallest whole number that can be multiplied to give a square number and you can see that students really couldn't couldn't get their head around that so even if you're looking at so question 5b is here the grade 7 students they were two thirds of the time they were they were picking up this mark so if you're trying to get a grade 7 you want to make sure if you can pick up that one mark that will jump you above virtually everybody because hardly anybody could do that for that grade 7 particularly but even at the grade 9 level people were not getting that 0.86 on average of the grade 9 students they were getting about 0.86 so that's something that you can go away at and then have a look at just in case they ask it again because they can see that that's a discriminator between all of the students they can see like that question is going to it's going to sort of separate the nines and the eights from the sevens so if you remember this this 720 it had even powers for the numbers apart from five which had an odd power so if you multiply it by five that will make the five into an even power like five squared so all of the numbers will be square numbers so when you multiply it together it'll be a square number overall that's something that you can analyze from this data take away remember that and try to make sure that if that question comes up again that you know how to answer that question where these students like for question nine are getting 96 97 percent let's have a look at this that should be a very easy question t to the 9 divided by t cubed you need to make sure that you don't make any silly mistakes on those because you can imagine if everybody's getting that question right then you're going to jump straight to the bottom again and then have to work your way up as the paper goes through so when you come across these questions try not to be too blasé about it try not to be too arrogant about it and just take the time nine three nine take away three just make sure that you you nail those marks because if you don't then like i say that can be quite catastrophic catastrophic for you what you're looking for for a seven is around about the 50 percent mark 62 63 percent for a, a an eight and about 75 percent for a nine that changes each year rough around that mark but that's about what you're looking for so you need to get the first half of the question right and and then try and push yourself on from there to try and go for an eight or a nine important things that i wanted to pull out from here as well is sets and notation so question 13b this one here where we're, we're shading regions in the venn diagram people just didn't know how to do that so if you go to bowtieteacher.com and you look for the set it has some questions there where it's asking you to have a look at the, the picture and see if you can click the buttons of the probability of a intersection b and it does some quite strange combinations and once you nail those then you can start to look at the, the ones that have three in there so in this case looking at the intersections the unions and then right it's got to be within f as well so you're combining like three of the letters together as we get towards the latter stages of the test obviously it's going to get harder and, and it starts to go towards the grade nine questions so you would expect these numbers to get lower and lower but with the question 19 with the sequences you can see that 36 percent of the marks are getting uh, attained by students and that's something that they've picked out as, as an example and said yeah that's something we need to work on so they're going to keep asking you those questions about sequences and term uh, predicting what's going to be the 50th term but also using simultaneous equations 
because you have two unknowns. You have A, which is the first term, and D, which is the common difference. And so you need to use those two simultaneous equations to generate A and D, and then you go on from there to, say, predict the 20th term, or what's the sum of the first 10 terms. You can do all of that once you know what A and D are. So you generate those two equations from the information they give you in the question, and then go from there. Standard form, this is the, the, the more difficult ones, where you have, say, 27 times 10 to the 2n, and then it says, well, what's that number to the power of 2 thirds, or 3 over 2? So if you're struggling with those types of questions, try to go back to the indices from earlier on. So when you have 3x squared, and then they raise it to the power of something, you split it apart, you treat each one separately, and then you put them together at the end. And that's exactly what you do with the harder ones. So you take the number, say 27, you raise it to the power of 2 thirds, you do that separately. You have 10 to the 2n, you, or 12n, and you raise it to the power of 2 thirds. So you multiply the, tw the 12n with the 2 thirds, you put them back together. If it's, if it's not in standard form, then you have to shift it around, just like you do if you have 25 times 10 to the 3, you make it 2.5 times 10 to the 4. So you've raised the power by 1 in the, in the 10 to the power. So if it's an algebra one, like 12n, 12n plus 1. Okay. So these are all like things you can take out from, from analysis of where students are really struggling. And as you get towards the latter stages, like I say, if you can pick up one mark there, so standard form, okay, that was 27% or 0.83. So on average, students failed to pick up a mark. You know, they couldn't get a full mark for that. So if you can pick up one by just taking that 27 and raising it to the power of two thirds, you'll get that one mark straight away. And you haven't done anything new. You've just looked at that question and thought, what can I actually do from this? I don't understand the 10 to the 12n part, but I can, I can take that and split it up and I can, I can do that part. Similarly for the, the graphs, this was the one where they had the uh, transformation of graphs. So if we just go to that question here, you have a point on a curve, doesn't matter what it is, but if you don't know how to do f of x minus 5, where you actually shift that to the right by 5 units, and you leave the y coordinate alone, then work on that. Try to actually um, study that and, and understand the 6 or the 8 different possible ways that you can, you can actually shift graphs around. I've done a video on that again. Um, topics that my students ask me to go through. So refer to that and it takes you through all the different ways that you can, you can shift the graph left and right, up, down. You can stretch it in the y direction or you can stretch it in the x direction. You can reflect it in y and you can reflect it in x. So you can try to learn all of those different possibilities because only less than half of students are able to, uh, are able to do that. So if you focus your energies on those topics that students can't do very well, that means you're going to jump above all of those students again, and you need to maintain that position so that you can, you know, if it's a really hard paper, let's say it's ridiculously hard, it doesn't matter if you get 30% as long as you beat everybody else. So that's kind of what you have to do when you're studying. It's not just about what you can and can't do, it's what other people can and can't do as well. And this question with the sine curve was really, really hard, but maybe you can think, well, Usually for sine, there would be one wave, and in this, there's three of them. So I know that it's a, a squash in the x direction, so a squash by factor of three. So stick a three in both of those if you're not sure, and you'll pick up one mark when, statistically speaking, students were picking up uh, 0.57 out of two. So if you can pick up one of those marks, again, you're, you're jumping ahead. So when you get to these later, later stages, try to bear in mind that even if you can't, you're looking at it and you can't do it, is there one mark that you can, you can achieve? Like, can you write down a formula, perhaps, that's going to help you, like with sectors and perimeters of sectors? Students really, really struggle with that. But if you write down that formula and start putting in some numbers, you could possibly pick up some method marks, if not the accuracy ones that are available. Similarly with vectors, students just look at vectors and, and they just go, no, I can't do vectors. But the, the first mark or two available is going from one point to another. Like I'm going to go A 
and two thirds of C or something like that. So try to just get through that initial barrier of I can't do this and pick up one mark and they will really help you as you get towards the top end. Another important tip that I wanted to talk to you about is that as my time as an examiner for Excel, what happens is, is that as an examiner you don't get the full paper sent to you in full. What happens is that they scan the whole paper and then they crop it and send you individual questions depending on what level of the, of the test you're marking. So when you're doing your test, this is what an examiner sees is we would get this sent to us, that cropped version of question six. And if you go below that line there where it says total for question six is three marks, if you go but below that, all of that work is cropped out and the examiner never sees it. So it's really important for you that you stay within the boundaries of that question. And what you see often is that students put a star on their work and then they just put the working out on another piece of paper or a, not another piece of paper, but another part of the test. Sorry. It's important that if you do a star and you put it in another part of the test, that will never be seen because the examiner will just see a star and they won't necessarily think, oh, that means that it's somewhere else. They will just see a blank or perhaps if that extra working out and the answer is somewhere else, they won't see it. So when you're doing your test, if you have to move outside of that boundary of this question, then put your hand up and ask for another piece of paper because then if you have that piece of paper in your test, then it has to go to someone to physically do. And I think that this is possibly why there are so many increases nowadays with the remarks because so many students do this and don't realize that they're, they're putting their, their answers all over the place. And this is the same for science and, and who I've marked for as well. So you need to make sure that whenever you move out of that space, even if it's slightly underneath, and sometimes I see like half of the word is above and half is below. So that's very difficult to see. And then the examiner has to send that back to Edexcel and they don't get paid for that particular question. So if you're doing 10,000 of these, you might just be going through, whereas you know they should really be sending that back for, for a recheck. So try to bear that, that tip in mind, not just for maths, but for all of your subjects as well. Just wanted to mention that. Okay, so for paper one, I've picked out some of the topics that we're gonna look at in more detail for us to practice and to get our head around as a tutorial. So first one is differentiation, because if you remember, that had 18 marks available for it, I think it was, and that only appears in paper one. So we're going to focus on that one first and have a little understanding of what dif differentiation actually does for us and why we're, why we're actually worried about it. So if we have a cubic equation like this one, y equals a third x cubed, etc., then this graph would look something like this, okay? And what differentiation does is it allows us to find what the gradient is at a particular point on this graph. So if I'm looking at this point here, the equation of the tangent here would have a particular gradient, and that is what differentiation gives us. It gives us an equation for the gradient of the tangent. Okay. Now, often we're not really interested in specific points where the gradient is kind of like at an angle, but we're more concerned with where the gradient is zero. So at this point here and here, that is when the gradient is zero, and that's what's called the turning point of the graph, because the, the graph is going up and then it turns at that particular point, it's at its maximum, it comes down, it's at its minimum, and then it goes up again in this case. But we're often in, interested in where the turning point of the graph is because we can use that in practical applications later on. So when we differentiate, we're actually finding the gradient. And this links into this uh, displacement velocity and acceleration as well, because if you have a displacement graph and time, then the gradient of that, let's say it goes like this, then the gradient is the velocity. So when you differentiate the displacement, you get the velocity. And if you have a VT graph, like a velocity time graph, 
then the change in the velocity is the acceleration. So we differentiate the velocity, we get the gradient, and that gives us the acceleration. So there's the link between those. How do we differentiate? Well, the notation is to write dy by dx. So change in y over change in x. That gives you a hint about the gradient. And we do the power times the coefficient or the number in front of the x. So 3 times a third, that's just 1. And that the power of x reduces by 1, so from 3 to 2. In the second one, we do 2 times whatever's in front of the x, which is currently a 1. So that's going to be a 2x, and the 2 becomes 1 because it's reduced by 1. So we don't usually write that. This one here, we have x to the power of 1. So times that by minus 3, we get minus 3x, and the 1 reduces by 1 to give us a 0. And then the 4, that has no x next to it, so that just differentiates to 0. So I'll just write that there for clarity. We can tidy this up here, so we get x squared plus 2x minus 3, because x to the 1 is just x, and x to the 0 is just 1. So this dy by dx, what that's telling us is that if I want to find out the gradient at any point, I substitute the x-coordinate in, nothing to do with y, and that will tell me, that will give me a number, and that number is the gradient. Okay. Now in this particular instance, we want to find out where the turning points are. So if we think about it, what is the gradient at the turning point? What's the change in y? Well, that's 0, and x is changing, so you can have any value for x, but you're always going to have 0 on the numerator. So dy by dx equals 0 tells us the x-coordinate of the turning point. So often you will put dy by dx, and then you put dy by dx equals 0. The gradient is 0, is the turning point of the graph, or the maximum or the minimum. It depends on the type of graph that we have. So we're going to put x squared plus 2x minus 3 equals 0 and solve this equation. So x plus 3x minus 1. So our x value is 1 or x equals negative 3. So that tells us that when x equals 1 or x equals negative 3, these are the turning points of the graph. What we usually do next is we need to find out, because they don't often give us the actual curve that we have in front of us, it's just uh, it's written out in this form. They ask us, well, is it a maximum or a minimum? So in this case, we have to do the second differential. And the second differential will tell us if it's becoming, if it's going up and then going down, or if it's going down and then going up, and we interpret that and call it a maximum or a minimum. So let's do the second differential. Now that has a bit of a strange kind of notation. d2y by dx squared, that's how we say that, but don't worry about that too much. We're going to differentiate this thing again. So 2 times 1, and the x reduces by 1, and the 2x would just reduce down to 2, and the x would become x to the 0. So the second differential is just 2x plus 2. Okay. Now, what that function tells us is it's telling us how the graph is changing, whether it's becoming positive and then going down, or if it's down and then up for the gradient. So what we can do is we can substitute our values for x here, our two values for x, into this equation. And one of them will be positive and one of them will be negative. So let's have a look for when x equals 1. We get 2x plus 2, 2 times 1 plus 2 is 4, and that is positive. Okay, that's positive. If I do x equals negative 3, then I do 2 lots of negative 3 plus 2 is minus 4. That's negative. We're not actually worried too much about the values, just whether they're positive or negative or not. So, when the second differential is positive, that means that it's a minimum point. Okay. Now, 
I could go into the details of why that's the case, but essentially you just have to remember that if it's positive, it's a minimum, and if it's negative, it's a maximum point. Okay. Yeah, I, I won't go into the details too much at this stage because it's quite late on in the day, but just remember that, that if you do the second differential and you substitute your value for x into there, then one of them will be a minimum and one will be a maximum for a cubic graph. Okay. If I did this for a quadratic graph, then when I differentiate, the powers would reduce by 1 every time, so I would have a linear term for my first differential. That means that there's only one solution to that when it equals 0, and that will give me my maximum or minimum of my quadratic. So if you imagine a quadratic graph like this, this would be the minimum point, or if it's upside down, then it would be a maximum point there, but there's only one turning point. Okay. When you do the second differential for that, you've gone from a linear term down to just a constant term. Okay, So that means that there won't, there, there won't be any solutions to that. You'll just have a number, like a positive number or a negative number. So you won't have to do any substitution for x because there won't be any x terms there. It will just be a number. If it's a positive number, it will be um, a minimum point. And if it's a, a, a negative number, it will be a maximum point there. Okay, so differentiation allows us to find the, the, uh, the gradient of the tangent of a curve. And the only other thing that they've asked for this is that you've had a random function and it says estimate the, uh, estimate the gradient at a particular value of x. So you have to draw a tangent to that and then do rise over run like that. But if you actually are given the function itself, the actual equation, then you differentiate it like that. Okay, so this is a higher level topic, obviously calculus. Um, but if you can get your head around what the purpose of differentiation actually is, then that will usually help you to answer the question. And if you ever see displacement, velocity, and acceleration in a question, then 99 times out of 100, that's to do with differentiation as well. Don't try and do speed equals distance over time because you won't get anywhere. Okay, the next topic which uh, yields a lot of marks in the paper one is simultaneous equations. So again, let's go through from, from basics. What does a simultaneous equation actually tell us? We usually have two equations on a graph, linear equations, and we're finding out the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate where they overlap. And that is the one point where both of these x and y-coordinates will be the same. Okay, so we use this to find two unknowns, the values for two unknowns, x and y. But in the exam, it's probably going to be a and d, or it could be x and y. So if we have 2x plus 3y equals 7, and um, 5x minus 2y equals 8, then you need to be able to to solve these. But I just want to show you that if you've got this calculator that I've recommended, then this will solve these for you. But obviously you have to show your working out as well. So if we go to menu and we go down to uh, equation of function, which is A, and you have simultaneous equations number one, two unknowns for GCSE it won't change. And we can actually plug in the values for x, 2x, 3y, 7, 5x, negative 2y, and 8. So x equals 2 and y equals 1. So we know that our answer has to be x equals 2 and then y equals 1. We just need to make sure that we, we show our working. So what the students tend to do is that they will multiply one of these, let's say multiply this one by 2, and multiply this one by 3, and that will then give us two new equations. So the first one will become 4x plus 6y equals 14. And the second one will become 15x minus 6y equals 24. And then because the term that we chose to be the same, which was the y term, have different signs in front of them, we're just going to add them together to cancel them out. So we add these two. If they were the same sign, we subtract them. So different signs add same side same sign, subtract, dast, that's how I kind of remember that one. 
So they, they've got the different signs, so we're going to add them together. So we get 19x equals 38. x equals 38 over 19 is 2. So we've got that one. And then we substitute the x equals 2 into one of the equations. So two lots of x. I'm doing this in the, the first equation here. Two lots of x plus three lots of y equals 7. 3y equals 7 take away 4. So y equals 1. So when you have these linear ones, you can just double one or triple one. It depends. You can sort of like, it's like cross multiplying on a common denominator for a fraction. You just multiply these by each other and that will, that will get them to be the same. But remember in the background, this is what we're actually finding out is the intersection point of these two lines. When we have a quadratic, it's going to be something like this and then a straight line going through and intersecting at two points. So we actually get two values for x and two values for y when we when we solve this. Okay, so um, if we have x plus y equals 7 and then x squared plus y squared equals 29, then we're taking the linear term and we're going to substitute that into the quadratic. Um, so we can substitute for y is 7 minus x. We rearrange this and we substitute it into the second one. So we do x squared plus 7 minus x squared equals 29. And we go about the whole rearranging this and, and, and solving it. So let's just write that as 7 minus x all squared. And we'll bring the 29 over so that we get a solution, uh, an equation we can solve with 0. So x squared plus 49 minus 7x minus 7x plus x squared minus 29 equals 0. Collect this all together. 2x squared minus 14x plus 20. And then cancel by 2 like that. And then I can factor this x minus 5x minus 2. So our two x values, we've got x equals 2 and x equals 5. And then we can take the y value from here, because y is 7 minus x. So y is 7 minus 2 and y equals 7 minus 5. So these are our pairs of points like that. Okay. And in, in the past, they've actually tried to extend this type of question because we've got, we've got two coordinates here. Like, these aren't the correct ones on this graph, but let's say those two coordinates there. And they say, well, now find the midpoint between them, or now find the gradient between those two points. Or they could say, well, now find the distance between those two points, because you can use Pythagoras to actually do that. So they're trying to extend it and bring in other aspects of the curriculum to try and test you at the highest levels and a lot of students will look at that and say, midpoint, what? And, 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 they, and they just lose it and they don't pick up anything. So just try to, when that happens, because it probably will, then just take a step back and go, hang on a minute. Is it talking about two graphs intersecting? Is it saying that they cross each other or cross over or anything, anything along those lines, which give you a clue that it's simultaneous equations? Because that's what you have to try to filter out when you're, when you're in that pressure situation. Once you've done that, you then ju just start bringing in, you know, oh, actually, yeah, distance between two points. I use Pythagoras for that. Or I can find the midpoint by taking the average of the x and the average of the y. All of these different things I've talked about in my videos you can have a look at or just put in the comments below if you need some extra help with that. The next topic which has uh, a lot of marks attributed to it is ratios. And so we're going to go from basics up to the highest level so that you can see where you're at and if there's anything you can do to improve. So at its basic level, we take a, a, a number, say 1,200 pounds, and we split it between three people in a ratio um, three to four to five. Okay. So we're going to split this 1,200 into 3 to 4 to 5. This is quite simple. We're going to add up the ratios like we always do. And we're going to divide 1,200 by the sum of the ratios. So 1,200 divided by 3 plus 4 plus 5 is 12. So 
So 1200 over 12 is 100. Okay. So each share, each of these is worth 100. This is three lots of 100, four lots of 100, and five lots of 100. So always check that your values add up to what you started with, because that will tell you you've got it correct. Okay, three to 400 plus that, that gives you the 1200, so that's fine. And then they'll usually say, well, what's the difference between Mark and John, or the lowest and the highest, and things like that. So you can just subtract those when, when you get to that point. At the next stage up, then you have a situation where you have, say, a ratio that they give you, and then another bit of information which, um, let's say, 63, this might be someone's age, or it might be um, a scale model, or something like that. They're asking you to find the other matching pair. Okay, so you've got a ratio of two to seven. You scale it up to 63. Then you divide these two, and you get the multiplying scale factor. So 63 over seven, that's times nine. Then this side you would times by nine, and that would give you 18. So this is when you have like like I say, you have a, a scale model of a ship, or you have like one centimeter to three kilometers on a map. These sorts of things are where ratios are actually inbuilt to the to the test, but you sort of do it without realizing it. But it's actually important that you understand what's going on in the background, so that when you get to the harder questions, you can understand how you can use ratios to help you. Um, if you're on your calculator and you go to the ratios button which is C, then you just have to match up the A to B, X to D, and A to B to C to X. So if we go here, on here, we've got A, B, C, and D, and the X replaces the one that's unknown. Okay, So A goes to C, but C is unknown, so the C is replaced with an X. So that's actually option number one. If it was this one that was un uh, the D, if that was unknown, then we would use option two. So option one, and we say two to seven, and the 63 we do know. So we press equals one more time, and we get X equals 18, which is the answer there. So that will double check that for us as well. We also use ratios in similar shapes. So it's important that when we're doing the similar shapes topic, we understand that there's ratios going on in the background because this is what happens is they'll have a shape like this and say 12 and that one's 18 and this is the length so we can actually put the length of let's say this is A and this is shape B we put these together as a ratio okay instead of just dividing the two let's do it as a ratio so that you can see 12 to 18 that's a ratio of 2 to 3. Okay, And if you want to go down to the 1 to 1.5, you can. But the 2 to 3 is helpful for us because when we're dealing with the area now, we actually take the length 1 and we square it. So the area of scale factor of area A to area B will be the square of the length. So a 4 to 9 ratio. Okay. And then we have the volume, that's going to be the cube, because volumes are like centimetres cubed, and area is centimetres squared, so the square and then the cube, so that will be an 8 to 27 relationship. So as you're answering these types of questions, where students, you can see in the, in the analysis, they drop a lot of marks on these easier questions, it's, it's, it's important for you to try to build up which one are you given? Because in an easy question, they'll give you the length and say, well, what's the length of BC? And you just times it by a scale factor, right? But if they give you the area initially or they give you the volume, which they haven't done, I don't think, but they could do, they're being horrible to you, then you have to know that you've got to take the square root of the volume or you've got to take the, sorry, the cube root of the volume and the square root of the area to get back down to the length. And then you can square it or cube it depending on what the second part of the question is. Um, so often they'll say, right, well, the area of B, let's say that's, you know, 180 centimeters squared, so we can work this as a ratio. We times that by 20, so we have to times this by 20. 
or the volume of this one and volume of the smaller one is, I don't know, um, 80. Let's keep it simple. And you have to times that by 10, so this one will be 270. Okay? And you don't have to worry about like the difficulty of cube rooting and square rooting because you've got it as a ratio there in front of you and you're just filling in the gaps and you can use your calculator to help you. What students tend to do is that they work with the area one when they should be doing the length one and the volume one, for example, vice versa. And then sometimes they say, right, they, they keep it as algebra. So 27 is the volume. So how do we get to the volume of the smaller one? Well, we have to divide by 27 to get to 1 and then times by 8. We're doing the same thing. We're dividing by 27 if we go that way. And then we div uh, times them by 27 when we go that way. So we divide by 27 times by 8. That's how we do it. The final case that we see ratios is in vectors. So we have a vector A, we have a vector C, and it will say that a point is in a ratio of 2 to 3, for example. So when we're doing ratios in this case, this is relatively simple because we say it's 2 out of, just like we've done in the basic ones, we add up the ratios, 2 out of 5, and then a ratio of 3 out of 5. But a lot of the time, students don't understand that when you're trying to do your proofs, you're trying to show that they're in the same ratio of A's to C's, for example, in a parallel line. So if you have two parallel lines, and that's A plus C, and this one is um, two, uh, 3 quarters A plus three quarters B and it says prove that they show that they're parallel to each other then you take the three quarters out as a factor and then you have A plus B this three quarters is your scalar quantity so that's just telling you how big it is the A plus B is giving you the direction so you have the same ratio of A's to B's oh sorry I've used A and C there uh, a to B in the first one is 1 to 1, and in the second one, A to B is 1 to 1. Okay, So if you can prove that they're both in the same ratio by taking out the 3 quarters as a factor in this case, but it's all about how they're, how they're in a ratio of 1 to 1, because if they're going in that direction and that direction, then they're going to be parallel to each other as they go even a, a smaller A and a smaller B, but still in the same ratio then they will be parallel to each other because they're going the same amount across and the same amount up. So it's a very um, deep application of ratios. But as you move into A-level and you do mechanics, for example, there are a lot of questions where they utilize this aspect a lot more. So try to get it nailed down now, especially if you're going to take A-level later on. OK, I said the probability would be a huge chunk of your GCSE, and that's true. It's in many different forms, so let's have a look at what we can do to make sure that we get those marks. The first thing to remember is that the probabilities all add up to 1. That's kind of obvious, but when you have these questions here where they have, um, like we had the strawberry and the mint and it had one missing here, um, students sort of didn't know how to, to answer this. So you have to make sure that all of these add up to 1, because all probabilities add up to 1. So you add up everything that you've got and subtract it from one and that will tell you what that one is in there and then what they tend to do after that is say let's let's say the probability is 0 0.21 and then they'll say right well you know throw the dice 300 times or toss the coin 100 times or um, go to school 200 days or anything like that you just simply multiply by whatever that number is so if Barney goes to school 200 times and his probability of being late is 0.21 you just multiply them together and that will tell you the number of days it will be late as an estimate because we can't be 100% sure so um, at its most basic level that's what probability is doing but there's also you know a, a chunk of marks available for doing these probability trees correctly so this has to add up to 1 and then these add up to 1 separately. So just make sure they add up to 1 as you go uh, vertically uh, amongst the branches. But also as you go along the branches and you multiply these, then your answer here 
and you do this one and that one there and then you do this branch multiplying those you get an answer and you get an answer here all of these ones add up to one as well so as we progress to the harder probability questions what a lot of students try to do is they try to work out every possible way of doing it when actually it's a lot more efficient to work out the probability of it not happening and then subtracting it from one because the probability of it not happening is usually just one or two and the probability of it happening it could be well I've seen ones where in the past where it's been like 18 different ways of doing things with like three different uh, events so try to first of all take a step back for a couple of seconds and think is it easy to actually say the probability of it happening and the clue is when they have things like at least if they use the words at least then this is a clue to use this method here because being late at least once for example or winning at least one game you could go win win let's do it in a different color you could go win 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 loss loss win so you're working out three things here and it's actually easier to say right well if you just lose twice what's that probability and I subtract it from one and that will give me the other three probabilities here okay so that not one if you're doing a question and it feels like it's taking forever you're probably doing the wrong way around you should be doing the not just take a step back and see if you can uh, see if you can answer that in a different way and then they have like the counters and they do this kind of thing and they say like add them together and it gives an even number or multiply them together or they'll say add them together and they give six these sorts of things then you don't have to break this down into all of the individual different ways of doing things let's say you want to multiply these together and get an even number then you have two odds here and two odds there so we've got four odds out of seven and three evens sorry three out of seven evens so with this type of question if it mentions odds and evens actually bunch them together because that's a lot more efficient than say going okay I'm going to do like one times three and then one times the other three and then this one times three and then this one times three um, to try and get an odd number for example and then you could have the three first and then the other three first so you, you're doing lots and lots of probabilities and if you do it as an odd times an odd then you'll get the answer straight away and that takes a lot of the um, a lot of the time away from answering that question um, and finally they'll the hardest ones that they have is when you have like um, I don't know um, four red tokens and the rest are green and then it'll say the probability of getting you know green green is some number um, let's say uh, let's work this out quickly is it three tenths maybe um, I don't know if this will work I just did that in my head so it might, it might not work but you would have this one it says we'll work out how many how many greens you have in the in the bag and you have to generate some algebraic fractions from this which is really really tricky but if we have x as the total then x minus 4 will be the greens so you can work out green green would be the probability of getting the first green would be x x minus 4 over the total and then the second green would be one less than this x minus 5 over the new total is x minus 1 and that equals 3 tenths because you've multiplied those you've gone down the green green branch and it's given you 3 tenths so you can then solve this equation by cross multiplying doing everything you would usually do to find your x value at the end so I've done a, a video on this as well you can refer to because I went through that really quickly but I'm trying to show you the progression through from the basic probabilities up to the hardest ones 
and how you approach those types of questions. Okay, another topic which appears in paper one only so far, that's not saying it won't this time, but is, is weighted mean. And what students tend to do is that they have, um, I don't know, 10 people in a lift and seven of them have a mean weight. So 10, 10 people in a lift, uh, seven of them have a mean weight of 73 kgs um, and two people have a mean of 60 kgs so what's the what's the mean of the other five or something like that so what students tend to do is that they'll do the 73 and the 60 and they just average those two but you can't because they're, they're, this one has seven and this one has two people so if you, if you think about it if you had like a, a hundred and two people doing a test and a hundred people averaged one mark okay let's go extreme a hundred people averaged one mark and two people um, got a hundred percent so they got a hundred out of a hundred okay you wouldn't just average these and say like one mark and a hundred and average those two because you can see that most of the people have got one mark so to say that they got like 50.5 or whatever as an average doesn't really make much sense because you can see that most of the people are bunched down in the one mark so what we do with these is we rearrange the mean uh, formula total divided by a number of people or the number of data points we rearrange that first to try and work with the totals okay doesn't matter what the individual data the data points are we're just interested in the totals so we would work out that the the total weight of these people and the total weight of these people and then we subtract them and then do what we need to do from there but don't just average the two because in, in the examiner's report they say things like at the higher level as you work towards the last last start, uh, stages of the test it's not going to be as simple as just doing these sorts of things and you shouldn't expect to get four marks for doing these sorts of things so just take a step back and think you know is this a is this a realistic thing what i'm trying to do here i'm just averaging two things that's probably not going to be the case so take a look at my videos where i do the weighted mean and see how we go about doing that but essentially you're just using with you know the, the formula for a mean okay you add them up and divide it by how many there are well you're usually given the mean so just reverse that process and work with the totals. Okay, converting units is a huge chunk of the, of the GCSD, so let's take a look at what we can do with these. Converting units, for example, meters per second into kilometers per hour. Like, it reminds me of, you know, if you have, you know, this kind of thing, and then you change it to, oh, I don't know why I just went to fail there. But that, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to change one aspect of this to get into um, the kilometers per hour, for example. So we want to go from meters per second into kilometers per second, and then kilometers per minute, and then kilometers per hour. Okay. So if you're given, say, 10 meters per second, let's turn it into kilometers per second, like 10 divided by a thousand gets you in kilometers per second okay and then if you do 10 over a thousand kilometers per minute like if you're doing that every second and you, you then do it for 60 seconds then you're going to times it by 60 and then to go kilometers per hour you're going to times it by 60 again because 60 minutes in an hour so this is the sort of thing that students it's saying like for a relatively simple topic you're you're struggling with this type of type of idea because you're getting answers that don't really make any sense so if you think about Usain Bolt and he runs you know 100 meters in less than 10 seconds let's just say it's 10 seconds he's running at 10 meters per second then you should be thinking right is my answer making sense like some of you get like thousands of kilometers per hour or you get like 0.002 kilometers per hour and things like that 
that that should be ringing alarm bells for you if you just think like does that make sense 10 meters per second is about 40 kilometers per hour let's see 60 times 60 times 10 over a, a thousand is three six zero 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 over a thousand that's 36 36 kilometers per hour okay so if you just learn that one 36 kilometers per hour is 10 meters per second that should give you an indication of the sort of uh, the sort of accuracy that you're looking at um, 10 meters per second is roughly 40 kilometers per hour and then converting something like 350 centimeters squared into millimeters squared for example or meters squared how we would go about this is just saying right I want to make an area of 350 so I can I can just choose random numbers here but 35 times 10 works centimeters centimeters and then I just write that again in millimeters so 350 millimeters and then 100 millimeters so when I create my new area here I do 350 times 100 so 350 times 100 I get 35,000 millimeters squared okay and if I wanted to convert that into meters squared then I could instead of going that way I'll go this way and 35 centimeters is 0.35 meters and 10 centimeters is 0.1 meters so when I create my area there I'm doing 0.35 times 0.1 is 0.035 meters squared all right so that's my advice to you for this is try not to think in your head like oh centimeters I times it by 10 okay try and write it out like this and same if you're doing a volume so if that was 350 centimeters cubed I would just have a one there and then I could turn that one centimeter into 10 millimeters like that okay so Turning that into millimeters squared, I would times that by another 10. And if I was doing it for my volume for the this one, then I would have my one centimeter would be 0 0.01. So this would that would be divided by another hundred. So this would be an extremely small meters cubed, 0 0.00035. Okay. So try to when you're converting units. Go use this method where you're thinking, right, 10 meters, I divide by 1,000 to get into kilometers, and then seconds into minutes into hours. The biggest one that causes students problems is something like, you know, you have a, a plane traveling for 8 hours and 35 minutes, and you have to do a speed equals distance divided by time. So I'm going to show you on the calculator how you can um, use the time function on here. So the button that you want is the one that's got degrees, uh, minutes, and seconds, but it looks like a, a circle, like a, a comma, and then a double quotes like that. So we use that one like 8, and then that's hours, 35 minutes. If I press equals, and then the SD button, it changes it into a time for us in decimal form. So we have... 8.5833 so let's try it. let's try another one like 3.5 hours if I press equals I can then turn it into time by using that button as well so 3 hours 30 minutes if I wanted 2 hours 45 minutes then I can turn it into 2.75 hours so instead of you trying to convert between minutes and seconds and things like that, you can use the time button as well to turn that into a decimal for you. Then you can just do speed equals distance divided by time. Okay, the next topic I'm going to concentrate on is angles in polygons. And the reason that it's worth so many marks is quite a lot of them is to do with, you know, areas, angles in a triangle add up to 180. So that's a, a, a significant chunk of that which we kind of take for granted. But still sometimes make mistakes on but a big chunk of them is when you have like a, a regular polygon and we've got like a pentagon and we have to work out the interior angle or the exterior angle so 
the formulas that we're looking for is the exterior angle is just 360 divided by the number of sides and the interior angle is the number of sides minus 2 times 180. So the interior one is the one that causes the most problems. If it's an irregular shape, like the, the shape is all over the place sort of thing, then you're just going to be using that version of the formula. And if it's regular, so you have to look in the question if it mentions regular, then you would usually be dividing by the number of sides so that you can find out the individual interior angle, something like that. So if you're looking for the, the individual one, you have to divide by the number of sides to get that value in there. Otherwise, you'd have a question where you have you know, lots of different angles in here. They're not regular. And it's like find out x. Or um, you know, it might have like a, the two of them are the same size. So you know, like that's x and that one's x as well. And you have to work out missing ones. So th those questions, those types of questions are kind of disappearing from the, the IGCSE. It's more about them combining these. Like they've had shapes within shapes. Um, like that's within an, an octagon. I'm not drawing this very well, but that's inside an octagon and it's finding that angle in there. So you would have the interior angle of this and then the interior angle of that one, and you'd subtract them. So that's a question that you could practice yourself in trying to find the difference between those two. Or they'll say, well, there's the exterior angle of 20 degrees. How big is this shape, or how many sides does this shape have? So you would rearrange this formula, because you know the number of sides, but you don't know how many, sorry, you don't know the number of sides, but you know the exterior angle itself. So number of sides is 360 over exterior. Okay, if they give you the interior one like that, it's best to work with the exterior and then just um, divide by divide 360 by that instead of trying to use this formula and then rearranging it and having to deal with some complex, more complex algebra there. Okay, just work with the exterior one and work like that. But mainly it's, it's, it's the triangle ones or you're using the angles in polygons in like circle theorems, for example, and they have like a, a diameter and another and another point on the circle. So you've got a hidden right angle in there, and they've got other things going on, like you know the arrowhead or or something like that. So you're using angles in polygons sort of subconsciously, but um, yeah, try to be aware of that and make sure that you're not making the, the simple mistakes. Check them on your calculator. And, and you'll get a lot of marks in the test. Okay, the next topic that crops up a lot is sine and cosine rule. And this is almost certainly going to be in one of, the, uh, one of the two papers, but usually paper one. And we have to just know what the conditions for when we use these. So sine and cosine rule is when there's no right angles in a triangle. And if you're given two sides and two angles, and then one of those is unknown, that's when you use the sine rule. And if there's three sides and one angle, that's when you use the cosine rule when one is unknown. So if you can learn that, the formulas are in the front. So refer to the formulas in the front of the, of the test. And your job is just to determine which of these conditions is true, because it will be one of those two. And sometimes it uses a combination of both, but usually it's just one or the other. And it's kind of under the radar because they don't say, oh, use the cosine rule or anything like that. But you have to just kind of go through a flow a diagram in your head. Like, does it have a right angle? Like, yes, no. If it's a yes, then you're using Pythagoras and trigonometry, like Sokotoa. And if it's not, you're going to be using sine rule and cosine rule. And usually, area of a triangle goes with it, like the half. A, B, sine C. So if you, you can use half A, B, sine C on a, a normal triangle, but if there's no right angle in there, then this is the angle. Then you need the two sides that enclose the angle. So this is A and B. It doesn't matter which way around they are, but it has to be the two uh, sides, either side of the angle. So that would be side C. And this is angle C. 
So just make sure you understand which way around, because some students, they do, they, they actually do half B, C, and then the angle there. So that's the wrong way around. You need to make sure that you have to do A and B like that. It has been known for them to combine cosine rule with some algebra, like they had a question where they had a triangle and it said like this was x or then this was y or something like that, but they said like y equals x minus 1. So you're using sort of simultaneous equations as well as the cosine rule that happened in the last season, I think, um, in January. So what you need to do is make sure that you're still applying these rules of do I have an angle in here, this was like 30 degrees or something, and can I use anything that I already know to try and actually start the question? Because once you get going, it says this in, in the examiner's reports as well, it says once students start start the question, it's like all or nothing. You know, if they know how to begin, they can usually do the rest of it quite quite well. But that's what separates the grade eights and nines from the sevens and belows, that they can actually just get over that initial barrier of starting the question. So if you can develop this sort of flow chart idea in your mind as you're as you're approaching these questions, it will point you to the topic that it's actually related to because that's the hard part of getting started is what is this question actually about? So for example, we had one recently which had just talked about intersecting equations. It had no uh, it didn't set it out with the simultaneous equations with the line and the quadratic underneath. It was talking about it in a sentence. And then students were just like, oh, I've never seen that one before, I don't know what to do. But if you if you saw the word intersecting and knew that that does it have the word intersecting? Yes, simultaneous equations. Then you would have got started and, and you would have picked up an extra five marks, which essentially is about you know a third of a grade or something like that in cases. So it's important that you, you take, when you look at a question and you genuinely don't know how to do it, come back to it later, don't spend too long on it. But when you come back to it, just think, is there any part of math which looks similar? You know, Are there any words that I can pick out like intersect? that will help me. If you see the word displacement, it's going to be differentiation. If you see the word tangent, it has lots of different meanings, but if it's on a graph, then you're looking at rise over run, you're looking at y equals mx plus c, all of those different things linked together. So for equation of a line, this is this is a topic that comes up so, so often, and students can't do it. They they're, have some fear of this, I think, but it's, it is tricky at first to get your head around They'll give you an equation like 3y equals 6x plus 5 or something like that. And they'll say that there's another line L2 that's perpendicular to this and goes through some point. Uh, I don't know if this will work, 3, 2. Um, and it will say work out the equations of, of these things. So. The most important thing when, whenever they're talking about equations of straight lines is you need to get this idea of y equals mx plus c. You need to try and get to that point every time. So at the moment we've got 3y, so we need to make that 1y equals by dividing everything by 3. Not just the y and the x, but everything. So we've got 2x plus 5 thirds. So when it's in that form, you can match up the m and the c, the gradient, the gradient, and the y-intercept. So it's sometimes worth sketching this thing. So just a quick sketch. It's got a gradient of two, and it goes through five thirds. So let's just say that's five thirds. The gradient of two is quite steep. So this is our first equation. Let's call that L1. Okay, y equals two x plus 5 over 3. Now if we have a perpendicular line to this and it goes through the point 3 comma 2 then it's going to be perpendicular so it's going to come through at right angles and it's going to go through let's say 3 comma 2 is there. This is just a sketch. We're trying to find the equation of that line and in order to do that we need to know its gradient and we need to know its y-intercept so we need to know that point there and we have to have an idea of the gradient. Okay. Now we can't find the gradient directly, but we can find it from this because the gradient of the perpendicular line, when you time the two gradients, let's do m1 times m2, the two gradients multiplied together always give negative 1. 
and you sometimes have to use that proof in your question that multiply them both together and say if it equals negative one they're perpendicular so two times the gradient of L2 is going to be equal to minus one so it's going to be minus one over two we say it's a negative reciprocal that means we've got two over one for the first gradient we make it negative two over one and the reciprocal means we flip it upside down to get minus one over two so you just Neg you just to put a minus sign in front. If it's already minus, you make it positive. So you make it as negative and flip it upside down. So now we know the gradient of L2. We can write it as minus a half x plus c. Because we found the gradient, that's ticked off. We're now trying to find the y-intercept. That's why we need this information here. Because I could draw a parallel line there or there or there, but it wouldn't go through for 3 comma 2. So there's an infinite number of possibilities here until we find this information here. So this is in the form of x comma y, x comma y. So I'm going to substitute y, which was 2, and x, which was 3. And that will now allow me to find c, because it's going to be c is 2 plus 3 over 2. So uh, 7 over 2, I think. It doesn't matter what it is. This, is. this is the intersection point. So we now found that is 7 over 2. So the final stage is to rewrite this equation as y equals minus a half x, because that's the gradient, and the y-intercept is positive 7 over 2. Okay? And then they put a little knife in there because they say, right, now write it in the form of ax plus by equals c. a, b, and c are integers. Okay, so I'm going to try and rearrange this to, so it's a half x plus y equals 7 over 2. So I've now got it in the form of x, y, and then a number, but they're not integers, so I have to times everything by 2. So I get x plus 2y equals 7. Okay, that's how we do equation of a straight line. It's all to do with this y equals mx plus c, and nine times out of ten I'd say they link in the whole perpendicular thing as well so you need to be able to multiply the two gradients together to get negative one okay the final topic that I'm going to talk about is series or sequences depending on, on how, what you call it but essentially it's having a, a sequence of numbers and being able to talk about different aspects of, of that sequence so sometimes they call it a series usually when they don't actually give you the numbers and just talk about the nth term or the sum of this. So let's start from the basics from, say, key stage 3. Like when you were younger in year 8 and 9, you would say, right, what's the difference between these? And you say, well, the difference is 3. So I make it 3n. And then if I write the 3 times table above this, you say, how do I get from 3n to the actual uh, the actual sequence? I subtract 1 each time. Okay, So this is actually the nth term. We're actually working out the nth term because I could say, well, what's the tenth term? Like, the tenth term. And you would say, well, n is 10. So 3n minus 1, that would be 29. So if I carried on this sequence up to the tenth term, I get up to 29. But the problem is, is that in the GCSE, they don't give the actual sequence. They say, they do the reverse. They say that the nth term is, the nth term of a sequence is something, and also the sum of the first something terms is some number okay and they don't give you the sequence but they expect you to be able to take this information and work out what the first term is what the difference between the numbers are and then you can work out anything from then okay once you found out a the first term a and the difference between them d you can find out the nth term or you can find out the sum of the n terms, like the first 10 terms, you can add them together. So let's have a look at how we would go about that. Let's let's pretend we've got this equation here, uh, this sequence here, but we don't actually know what it is. 
okay I could say that the fourth term the fourth term is 11 so they've given you that information in the in the question but not this sequence how would we generate an equation from this well we use a formula for nth term instead of doing this process where we go what's the difference between them we use a formula called a plus n minus 1 d okay that will give me the nth term so we can now do a plus n minus 1 d let's just check that works with the sequence that we've already got quickly a is 2 plus n minus 1 times the difference is 3 and when I collect this all together I get 3n minus 3 plus 2 that's 3n minus 1 so this same equation here done the exact same thing as this okay but we've never had an equation before we've just gone well what's it going up by and then you sort of, sort of do a fudge factor to get the formula now we've actually got a formula which gives us the nth term so the nth term is 11. So we can say that 11 is equal to a plus n minus 1 d. And it's the fourth term, so n is equal to 4. So 11 equals a plus 4 minus 1 d. 11 equals a plus 3 d. Okay? Which makes sense. If you think about this, 11 is the first term plus three lots of the difference, so n is minus 1. And then the sum, let's say the sum of the first three terms is, so the first three terms, 2 plus 5 plus 8 is 15. Okay. Now, this formula, a plus n minus 1d, is not given to you, but the, the sum is. So the sum formula is n over 2 brackets 2a plus n minus 1d. So we can substitute this information in. The sum is 15. n is 2. We don't know what a is. And the n was 3 minus 1 and d we still don't know because remember they've just told us this written information so we have 15 equals 3 over 2 times 2a is uh, 3a plus 2d times 3 over 2 is 3d okay yeah so we've generated two equations here and here. So we can use simultaneous equations to, um, to work out a and d. And in this case, which doesn't often happen, the, the, the d's are the same. So 11 equals a plus 3d and 15 equals 3a plus 3d. So we subtract these two equations. They've got the same sign, so we, we subtract them. We get 2a equals 15 minus 11. So a equals 2, which kind of makes sense. And then we substitute in for d. a plus 3d equals 11. So 3d equals 11, take away a. So d is 9 over 3 is 3. So we've now found a and d. So that's the key part of this question, is finding the first term and the difference between them. So now we have that information, we can find out the sum of the first 10 terms by substituting into that formula, or we can find another term like the, the 20th term. So 20th term is going to be a plus n minus 1 times d. Okay? So 19 times 3 is 57 plus 2 is 61. So the 20th term of this sequence would be 61. Now that we found A and D, this, this is relatively straightforward, but you have to learn that formula there. Okay? Okay, everyone, so I know that was a really long video there, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to, to take from the data some information that could be useful to you for your study. There's no possible way of me predicting exactly what's going to be on that test, um, obviously, unless I wrote that paper and, and told you. Uh, so it's, it's about taking information from the analysis of the data of, what's come up before, what's likely to come up in paper one. This is 
such a small sample size. We've only got like six papers or, or three seasons to work with. So we can't take any of this as fact. This is just trends and things that I've, I've found. And you might actually see some more trends. But the main thing that, 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 to take away from this video is that you have to study virtually everything for paper one. And then for paper two, we can make a lot more of, of an informed decision of, of things that have happened before. So they're not likely to come up again. There is some crossover that we can talk about. So after the seventh, stay tuned for another video where I'll talk about what's likely to come up in paper two. But for now, work on those things that were at the top left-hand corner of that um, of that diagram I showed you. Uh, angles in polygons, differentiation, pro uh, probability, rounding. Make sure you're you're comfortable with your rounding. And these are the things that are most likely to come up. Okay. So I hope that was useful for you. If it was, please let me know in the comments below and um, I'll try and do the same thing for maybe uh, IGCSE Paper 8 or GCSE, um, depending on how useful that is and because it takes a long time to be honest and, and if it's useful for you guys. Okay, good luck in January.